Welcome to the Unapologetic Heroine podcast, where myth is made manifest. As the author of The Way of Inanna, A Heroine's Guide to Living Unapologetically, this podcast is based on Inanna, the Sumerian goddess of love and war who embodies multidimensionality and lives unapologetically true to her heart. We showcase the wisdom of individuals courageous enough to do the same. These are inspiring stories of what it takes to be authentically who you are. My guests honor the wisdom of love, embrace the polarities of being human, and walk their truth. I am your host, Shauna Zalazo, licensed psychotherapist, intuitive channel, and author of the book, The Way of Inanna. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hello, friends. This is going to be such a fascinating conversation. My guest today is divine feminine scholar and performance artist, Dr. Annalisa Durr. She is the founding creatrix of Journey to the Goddess, which includes Journey to the Goddess TV, workshops, and sacred art performance. Dr. Durr combines ancient theater traditions, myth, and ritual to reclaim the divine feminine. With a background in acting, Dr. Durr's academic work centers on the myth of menstrual danger. Her focus is on healing and reframing our connection with the female body to be experienced as, in her words, natural, powerful, and life-affirming. Having written her doctoral dissertation on the subject, Dr. Durr's forthcoming monograph from Inner Traditions Press is inspired by her larger body of work and helps women reconnect with their power. She helps us heal the conflicting relationships many of us have with our menstruating bodies and the broader cultural messaging many of us have come to internalize. As a goddess scholar, Dr. Durr offers a number of fascinating insights into one of my favorite myths, the descent of Inanna. I can't wait to delve into the many ways Dr. Durr is an unapologetic resurrector of the divine feminine. Welcome, Annalisa. Your accomplishments are so inspiring. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Shauna. That was the best introduction ever. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) It's all true and it's so beautiful. I'm grateful to have you here with me today. Um, Annalisa, I want to start by exploring your ritual art performance and discuss the potency of such work for you personally as the creator, but also for the viewer. As in art form, performance art enacts the experience of the viewer listener. The transformation that occurs within the observer is part of the artistic creation. To me, sacred art, which is what you do, is art that alchemizes, heals, and expands. It appears that the people of ancient Sumer also understood the power of ritual art performance as seen in the hymn, The Holy One, which is a hymn I explore in gate six of my book. In it, there's an inversion of gender stereotypes during a ceremonial procession of Inanna's worshipers. The men carry vulvic hoops and the and they dress the left side of their body in women's clothes, while the women carry phallic swords and axes and dress the right side of their body in men's clothes. By doing so, they offer a statement about balancing the masculine and feminine aspects of self, which is consistent with Inanna's insistence on reconciling and integrating her polarities. Can you share about your engagement in ritual theater, Annalisa, and and if it is a devotional practice or a means to connect directly with the divine feminine? Yeah, um, I would say that it's both of those things at once. And let me give you just a little context in how this project even developed. So a another artist friend of mine, uh, Kate. Um, Kate of Jacku House, she and I challenged each other to do a three month uh, menstrual art performance series on anything and then post it online. So, what that became for me, because at that time I was also writing my doctoral thesis. So, it started out as kind of a um, research inquiry, which then developed into yes, a devotional practice and also a way for me to connect with and channel the divine. I almost see see them as maybe one in the same Mm. for me at least. And, um, and I, it was, it's also really a calling. So each piece came to me 
The pieces came to me when I stepped on the land. Uh, so there wasn't much, like, for example, the first piece, um, Blood of Her Holy Womb, mm. was a piece that I created after the Ventura, the, the Thomas Fire in California and, and Ventura, California, where I was living, and it completely decimated the area. And at the time, it was the largest wildfire in California history. And so as I was exploring these themes of death and rebirth um, when it comes to menstrual fluids and menstrual blood and how these fluids relate to f- divine feminine powers as well, it became clear that 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 the regenerative element that the land so needed could come through with these menstrual fluids and me acting as a kind of a conduit in a way of like the spirit of mother nature, but also in the process of doing the performance piece, like healing the physical mother nature, the earth, the land, the trees. Um, So in that respect to the um, pieces are site specific. They belong to a certain time, a certain place, and it wouldn't really make sense to perform them anywhere else. Mm. Wow, I love that so much. <laughs> I love it because it is a doorway. It, it, what you're conveying is that through you, there's a through you and through witnessing the art, which, by the way, for our listeners, is on your website, journeytothegoddess.com. So you can see these incredible pieces. Um, But really, I see that as you offering a portal to not only the location, but what is held in that site, the the codes and the keys that are 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 in the land um, and to also experience through witnessing what you created a a visceral healing in their own body this is one of the reasons i love performance art is just <laughs> the embodied aspect of it you know which is so powerful yes and i'm i'm it's it's important for me to hear how the work speaks to other people because so so far to this point it's just been me coming up with the idea or channeling the idea and performing it and then mm-hmm. sometimes every once in a while, someone will come up and tell me what the performance meant to them when they've seen it. So, and I don't, you know, I don't necessarily do it for that reason, mm-hmm. but I'm so glad mm-hmm. that it's transformative for the community, for individuals and um, for the land and for the transformation of the goddess herself. Oh, so that yes. that <laughs> other layer is reclaiming aspects of feminine power, of goddess feminine power that have been subsumed by patriarchal narratives or denigrated or demonized um, and subsumed in the way, for example, in the piece at the Vatican, mm-hmm. <laughs> I performed this piece of Mary Magdalene um, on Easter Eve at the Vatican, kind of guerrilla style. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, there were so many, I could see so many rich ancient goddess symbolisms in this story of the red Easter egg from the mm-hmm. Eastern Orthodox tradition. Mm-hmm. And then I said, you know, I said to myself, this completely needs to be reclaimed and re-imbue the power of life and death, not only as a power of the goddesses, regenerative symbolism, but hand that over to Mary Magdalene and make that part of her story Mm. that she has it in herself. It's not just Jesus who has the, or Christ that has that power. Mm. (laughs) Annalisa, that right there (laughs) is so powerful (laughs) because it is a way that, you know, is through, through the reclamation of that, um, it gives us as women <laughs> who are who are living on earth at this time to also reclaim that by having a, a visual understanding, to have a, a, a guide before us in Mary Magdalene and Inanna and these amazing, beautiful goddesses that have shown us the way. Um, yes, that that yes. is just so beautiful. You Thank know, you. When, <laughs> of course, it's. I'm grateful to you for bringing that forward, especially too, because you know, um, we we have so many young people incarnating now that are just so awake, right? And and they are looking for they they're not going to follow the old paradigm. They need, <laughs> uh, you know, like instruction right. on how to move forward in in cultivating a new way. And and you're providing that. You're providing a. a 
a different perspective, a visionary perspective, um, and and helping these <laughs> all of us, but especially these incoming souls with a, a way forward, a, a, so that they can learn what wasn't available to you and I growing up. You know, um, which is so powerful. <laughs> um, wow! Thank you. <laughs> yes, it's so true. You, I want to get to this just powerful term that you use, and um, my way to that, I'm just going to describe that in in Nana's mythology, in that same myth we were describing early, the, earlier, the Holy One, the priest covers his sword with blood and sprinkles it on the throne of the court chamber at which the procession uh, ultimately arrives. And um, I've heard that interpreted, you know, in my own research as as being sort of indicative of a sacrificial offering, but I personally don't view it as that. And in my book, I position it as an honoring of female blood, of menstruation and the potency of creation therein. This scene might aptly be described using your brilliant term as a resacralizing of female blood. And I wondered if you could describe what you mean by that term. Yes. I I love that you've asked me to kind of open that up and talk about it Um, because it's actually not a term that I... um, go into into great depth within the dissertation itself, even though it's the first word in the title. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, you know, resacralizing implies, right, that we're going to make something sacred again. Mm. And, you know, sacred for me is this relationship with the divine. And depending, obviously, on the tradition or the person, like they might demarcate some things as sacred in in the phenomenological world and some things as um, mundane, like not sacred. But in, you know, in that, in my own worldview, everything in in the world is sacred. Everything has the divine spark in it. Okay. So I want to lay that, that foundation first, Mm. but more specifically to menstrual fluids itself and the resacralizing, this is about really an honoring, an honoring of the power of creation that is inside, that is intrinsic to inhabiting a female body, whether or not a woman chooses to bring new life into the world. And of course, creativity can manifest in so many ways beyond having a human child. But this is really about honoring this this capability and this great gift, which carries a lot of responsibility with it. And finding a way through this re-sacralizing to help other women see it as a gift and see it as a responsibility and start to find restoring and re-ritualizing um, and coming into a uh, right relationship and right as an R I T E, mm-hmm. like a ritual, right? Mm-hmm. Rewriting that relationship. Um, and in, in doing that kind of reweaving also relationship with, with the divine. Mm. That's great because it it is, you know, one of the things that is it a common understanding, of course, of, of 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 our cycle of menstruation? Is that like we hear this sort of in in everyday speech about oh, this is a curse. I have my curse this month. You know this sort of thing, and and right. there's a vilification of it. And I what I love about what you're doing is you are taking us back in time, quite literally, to a <laughs> to a period wherein there was there was right relationship with this experience and with the, our cycles and with Mother Earth and the sort of it's it, it is very significant too because also you know a lot of folks who are there's a a lot of resistance to uh, bleeding and to what to to hide it to keep it from our partners like all of these things that you know sort of like (laughs) the shame where in what you're inviting us to do is to celebrate it and to engage with it ritualistically which yeah it's just so powerful (laughs) (laughs) it is is, we need this we need this I I agree I I agree I think we I think we really do talking about the young souls that earlier coming in Mm -hmm. um who who need who need new 
who need a new form of guidance. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, this is our job as women today who Mm -hmm. are aware to help guide, you know, the young ones into a different relationship with their bodies. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it just, you know, as, um, when I was doing psychotherapy, I worked with a lot of young folks who are just really just struggling so much with their relationship to their body and body image sort of uh, issues and such. And and, I mean, it was very striking to me how early it began. So yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm sure. And I think that's, you know, re the thing about the sacred as well is that I would actually like to see the sacred to become a normal thing Mm. so that it's not just like, you know, something that happens over there in the church or the religions, and then people feel very weird about it. It's like Mm. re-sacralizing should all could, could also be re-enchanting the world, seeing the whole world as an expression of the divine. And when you do that, then you start to understand your part in the cosmic play. Oh, yes. And that is such a divine feminine consciousness perspective, because it really is about see the, the idea of the fact that we're all connected, that we're all one. I right. just totally agree. And because when we have, when we hold that perspective, we also can't help but see our responsibility. Um, right. Yeah. Beautiful. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um In your performance art piece, The Oracle Remembers Gaia, which I absolutely love, and I, again, want to encourage listeners to go and see this beautiful artwork on her website, Um, but you, in this particular piece, I loved your inclusion of the symbolism of the reverse triangle on your chest that you draw Mm. out of your own menstrual blood and as an offering to Gaia herself. I was wondering if you could explain that piece in more detail for our listeners. Yes, yes. You're you're taking me back to that moment. It's interesting because as we said, kind of off camera, if you will, before we started, I am in Athens currently, Athens, Mm -hmm. Greece, and I revisited Delphi last week. I hadn't been there since that um, performance piece. Mm. Um, And there's actually an interesting story behind that too, that feels like it's integral to the piece, but you don't get to see it. And that is that I went to perform that piece in front of the uh, Temple of Athena there at the Oracle Mm -hmm. Delphi site. Mm. And I was actually kicked out. (laughs) (gasps) <gasps> I was like, because I was, they could see I was pulling stuff out of my bag and they were like, is this person going to desecrate the temple? I mean, I understand, right, why they would do that. Um, because I, at this point, don't ask for permission to perform. So, um, but as I turned to walk away, there was this cat sitting on the ruins and it's common to see the the, the feral cats everywhere in Greece and on all the monuments, they're there, but they don't typically engage with humans. So I turn to go and this cat is staring me dead in the eye and it's telling me, meow, meow, meow. Mm. Like I literally heard the goddess through that meow say, keep Mm. going, keep going, keep going. You've got to do this. And I I left that particular area and I was like, I will not be thwarted by the patriarchy. (laughs) I will keep going. Um, Mm. And so I found kind of like an offsite area to perform this. And um, yeah, generally, you know, I was inspired to do this piece when I got to the land here. And the story just kind of downloaded in me. And the basic premise is that in ancient times, uh, the Oracle of Delphi actually used to be a sacred site to Gaia herself. And then with the um, kind of the adherence to the God Apollo, they came in and this is, there's kind of a historical piece too. And they took over this Oracle and gave it to Apollo. And so basically it has such strong divine feminine roots and Apollo, of course, actually slays the Python that is sacred to Gaia, which is why the Pythia is named, the Oracle of Delphi is named Pythia mm. after the Python, the, the snake. Mm. So it still has those ancient goddess roots attached to it in name as well. Um, so I was just like, this land wants to be reclaimed as Gaia's sacred Oracle. 
And so I felt like I was channeling as a modern day oracle of Delphi that was actually um, predating Apollo's oracle. I was like the oracle of Gaia coming to reclaim this land as hers. And so that was the premise. And um, I quoted some text from um, the Homeric hymn to Gaia, um, which of course is not coming to me in this moment. It's like, you know, <laughs> to Gaia, mother of all. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and then toward the end, yeah, I, I made an offering to Mother Gaia there on the land and 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 devotionally poured my menstrual fluids into the into the um ground there and mixed the the dirt with my menstrual fluids and then yes and then painted the inverted triangle on my chest um and again the inverted triangle which the the Sumerians and still the the this the Hindus and in, in Sanskrit like the the downward facing triangle is um a sign for sacred female power mm. sometimes the vulva sometimes woman but it denotes sacred female power mm. i and just that i love that <laughs> <laughs> i was just going to yes. say I, I love that just for so many reasons but also because it's very in line with being the unapologetic heroine like this is <laughs> me <laughs> It's, 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 it's an interesting process for me, I will say, because I still struggle with the internalized menstrual shame Mm -hmm. and internalized sexism. Mm -hmm. And yet I just keep doing the work anyway. And thank you for doing that work. Um, You know, and you know, you, I watching it, anyone who watches the piece completely can see that you're channeling. Um, And again, you know, that's, that's what sacred art does. It, it, it's transcendent. It takes us somewhere. Like you very much are acting as an embodying a portal in that, in that piece. I mean, in all of them, but that, that whole experience of, of reclaiming it and then having Gaia speak through you and work through you. (laughs) It's, it's very, very clear. It comes across so Mm. beautifully. And what I loved about that that act of, of that inverted triangle on your chest, what I loved about it was that it, um, it very much is in line with Inanna's wisdom because it's almost like combining the second chakra with the heart. Cause where you're drawing it, you're drawing it near the heart chakra, but you're also drawing yes. a second chakra <laughs> image. It's really beautiful because there's so much conveyed in that, in that, in that act. There's so much wisdom that we learn about that the, the creative process can be done through love. You know, the merging of the heart and the, and the womb center the heart and the second chakra is just yes. such a powerful statement. I love that so much about that piece. (laughs) Thank you. I I love that reflection. Mm, That was really helpful. Mm -hmm. And the, the, you as a scholar have a lot of understanding about symbols and um, you know, the, the symbols like the, you mentioned, of course, the inverted triangle, you mentioned the egg. um, And then of course, um, there's the snake, which you mentioned, right. And the owl Mm -hmm. and the mirror to name a few, right. These were definitely, yes, yes. Yeah, and there's such powerful symbols um, encoded and and with with power. And and when you use them or they're brought to light again, we engage with them, and it feels as though the power within gets activated within us. It's uh, you know the, so many of these symbols, of course, to your point, like you were describing, have been conscripted <laughs> by the patriarchy. But what you're doing helps us reclaim them. Is there anything that you want to share about the potency of symbols in your work um, at this time? Oh, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I think I think like any image. Mm-hmm images help bring meaning Mm -hmm. sometimes an image can be can be not always but can be um what I want to say like a through line or a a Mm -hmm. quick way to receive a terma like a like Mm -hmm. a source of wisdom Mm -hmm. you know and I think that's why the ancients especially used to develop these symbols because they convey the power of the deity or the, 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 the thing itself without having to write it out. Hmm. Um, like a yantra, like in the Hindu tradition, you have the yantras, the visual representation of the, the mantra or the deity itself. Mm-hmm. They convey so much wisdom and power. And I think that 
symbols can really do that. Um, uh, there's one symbol that I use a lot in my work that's not specifically related to Inanna, but the goddess generally, and that is the red hibiscus flower. Mm -hmm. And in the Hindu tradition, that is the representation of Shakti, of, of all the mm -hmm. goddesses, you know, and, um, and in my own life, I, I will make this a really long story short. Um, I became obsessed with the hibiscus flower uh, as a teenager uh, when I when I visited Hawaii, and I was like, so entranced by this symbol and this beautiful flower that I had to get it tattooed on my body the moment I turned eighteen. And then twenty years later, or fifteen years later, whatever, when I first learned that the hibiscus flower is the symbol of the goddess of Shakti, I was realized in that moment that the symbol of this flower was so potent that it, like the goddess had marked me with yes. her symbol. <laughs> she did. <laughs> you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. symbols have a way, whether they're just visual representations or, or, or you know, fully formed representations like the flower itself to convey meaning and power. Wow, absolutely. And I, I really appreciate so much that that was so clear to you as a young person, you know, at 18 to really be dialed in, even if you weren't exactly sure as to why <laughs> your soul right. recognized that. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's, it's like a soul memory of like your, um, you know, like when you imagine Mary Magdalene, um, you know, sort of walking among her co fellow priestesses, you know, you can imagine them all sort of wearing something that identifies their connection, um, yes. you know, a bracelet yes. or something. Right. And, yes. um, and I see that as, as what you're describing that, that, that beautiful flower now on you marks you as a, as, as that, that priestess, you know, and just what a beautiful understanding that you were able to access so young, <laughs> It's just, see, this is why you're here to teach the young folks a new way, because <laughs> you know, you know what it's like. Um, oh, you came and, in and, tr <laughs> and trust, trust is like, I think the most important underlying factor there. Yeah. Trust absolutely. your intuition. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Is there a, a symbol in the mythology of Inanna that that stands out to you that you particularly love? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would have to say that that inverted tri triangle is mm -hmm. very important to me. Mm -hmm. But as of late, I've become really fascinated with the eight-pointed star mm -hmm. that is belongs to her and Ishtar. And um, I think it's because I've been watching this Turkish drama called The Gift, and they and this mm -hmm. the creators actually kind of draw on a lot of different goddess myths and symbology mm -hmm. um and there is a like the, the, actually the priestess lineage is marked with an eight-pointed star mm. and so that really got me kind of thinking about that more deeply and um I, you know I'm not I'm not sure I'm still working with it and what it means to me um mm -hmm. you know and a symbol of Venus for sure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um probably our connection to the to the celestial realm mm -hmm. um yeah, but that, that's that's where I am with her symbolism and what mm. speaks to me at the moment. Wonderful, wonderful, because I I too have that has definitely caught me as well, and um and also am still in in, in sort of meditation with it. Uh, but I I appreciate that so much. Certainly, the connection to Venus and and sort of the, that being the cosmic heart of the universe. You know, um, yes, <laughs> yes, I I am so. Uh, intrigued um I would love to follow up with you and see where you arrive in the future with that because <laughs> yes. your perspectives on it are so fascinating and you know that's one of the things that really stands out in your work is not only the you know I'll preface this by saying that you know Inanna's Inanna represents multidimensionality and because of that you can see that she she gives herself permission to evolve and and really all that is inana lends itself to the plasticity of expansion and growth and because of that multidimensionality that she embodies she offers 
many points of connection for individuals. And what strikes me is your connection with Inanna because it's so unique and so fascinating. Um, you know, in your work, you position the descent of Inanna as what you call a new menstrual myth that more holistically embraces embodied experiences of menstruation. Is there, is it possible for you to give a sneak peek of this radical interpretation of Inanna's descent? Yes. Yes. I love that. A sneak peek. Yes. It's, it's just so challenging for me to, um, be, be, you know, very, very direct or very concrete about this myth. There's, I start talking about it and then all of a sudden I want to share the little details. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, as I was preparing to talk with you today, I was like, you know, to, to circle us back to the beginning, this is really about sacred female power. Mm. And, the myth, I remythologized it in two ways. And one was at the level of the myth itself, where I was like, listen, I really see that Anana and her sister Areshkagal, who is equally important in this myth, mm-hmm. right? That they that they really represent these archaic goddesses, they're pre-patriarchal, and that this myth has been a little bit overtaken by kind of patriarchal um narratives basically as the culture of Sumar increasingly became that way itself. And, and I saw that in the way that the myth has come down to us today, that these two goddesses have lost their, their complete potential. Um, they're, they're, they're of that full sacred power, sacred female power, as in the life giving, the life sustaining, the life taking and the regenerative power. And they each represent kind of separate realms. And so in a part, this was about reimbuing each of them with the fullness of their sacred female powers and suggesting that maybe they're actually the same goddess split into two. Mm. So that was one level that became really important, wasn't intentional, but it became important as I went along writing. Mm. And then the part, the menstrual narrative itself, which is really what I saw the first time I read the myth. I don't know why that was just what was downloaded in me. <laughs> and actually the more I research now, cause I'm still re-researching, um, I really 100% believe, okay, maybe 95% <laughs> <laughs> believe that, that this was actually meant, that the Sumerians actually meant this as a sacred menstrual narrative. And I will tell you that because of some stuff I'm reading about Ayurveda and Ayurvedic Mm. goddesses and moon cycles Mm. and how specific goddesses represent the different phases of the menstrual cycle Mm. um, within this particular Ayurvedic tradition. And so I was like, I really am very convinced. Whereas before I was like, this is just what I'm seeing. And now I'm like, this is it. So of course I could be wrong. And you can really interpret the myth any way you'd like. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But let me pull back a moment and say that, again, this is a myth, um, the way that I've remythologized it, to make, to frame menstruation, like the menstrual cycle itself, but, and, and more specifically, the, the part that is the most challenging for a lot of people, the premenstrual and the bleeding phase, to re-imbue both of those facets um, as life affirming, as natural, as ordinary, and as extraordinary from both the psychological and the physical perspective, because there's, there's this psychologizing of learning to internalize negative menstrual shame or negative menstrual narratives that, that for many, um, manifests as shame or embarrassment, et cetera, et cetera, which actually has not only a negative psychological aspect on women, but as I was reading in an article today, likely has physiological um, negative impacts on women as well. Mm. So this is a matter of women's psychological and physical well-being to change our perceptions around the menstrual cycle as not, yes, as an ordinary biological function Mm. that happens to women, from the ages of, you know, nine-ish, 10, 11, 12 to, you know, 55, let's say on on the far end. Um, But it's also extraordinary because it connects us to our 
you know, to the, to the, to the cosmos, to the whole mystery of creation, Mm. women as conduits, channels, the connecting channel between um, cosmic creation and human creation. And so I think we can have that both and at the same time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I really appreciate that and just love that it came to you upon your first read of the, of the myth, <laughs> because that, you know, that set, that reads to me the way I interpret that is that, you know, as a performance artist yourself, you experience, um, you know, and part of your craft is to demonstrate through the embodied expression you know, through, through embodied uh, expression so you you experiencing the myth as a physiological process makes complete sense to me and again stands out it's such a unique perspective and it stands out because this is what we need right now you know we really need to understand how to live this new this new way, how to put it into practice, how to, how to implement the wisdom that the goddess has been sharing with us. And that's resurfacing through the unapologetic resurrectors of divine feminine consciousness like you. (laughs) I love that. I love that. I love that. Yes. Yes. Very, very Mm -hmm. powerful. And it, there's so much too about, um, you know, folks that have gone on various, um, you know, like young kids that are young children or teenagers that are put on the pill or something to, you know, regulate their cramping or all this stuff or in, you know, their intense periods and stuff like this. And then they become amenorrheic because they, the, the, the medication that they're on um, might, uh, you know, halt their period. So it's just an important conversation to give us pause and explore sort of like, Hmm, What's behind that? First of all, what's behind right. that, and and how do we reclaim it? And you're giving us a very very practical way to do it, you know. And and you sort of you're teaming up with the <laughs> with the goddess to do so, which is just so perfect. Um, and truly, I, I yeah. And and you know, before we close, I I want to just finish with this one last piece that actually speaks to that that sort of collaboration with the goddess, which is collaboration because it feels mm. central to your craft as an actor and as well like as your role as a guide as a teacher um yourself so I, I wondered if there was anything you might want to share about the value of collaboration uh on the the journey to the goddess path yes you know, yeah i yes 100 percent i think like you said that is a divine feminine value it's also our natural state of being. I mean, it's an ecological principle and anyone that's in modern ecology understands that, you know, there's that both end of autonomy and interdependence and collaboration. And so we are only as strong as we are together. You know, the, so I think we, we, as in we in the United States in particular, live in a very individualistic culture. And while it's important to identify a sense of self, um, maybe a sense of purpose, your dharma um, and duty, it's also important in that sense to use that word dharma, that you're not, your dharma is not outside of relationship. Dharma is always interdependent and in relationship Mm. with, with others. And so this journey to the goddess for me has always been about relationship with the divine, all of my divine guides and goddesses and ancestors, um, but also my relationship with women and learning how to, I've always been close with women, but learning how to have, I think, deeper and more meaningful relationships with women and how to, how to support other women um, on this journey as well, and not see other women as, um, either either better than me or lesser than me mm-hmm. or is competition because competition is also you know a value of modern western culture and patriarchal cultures generally speaking mm-hmm. but as collaborators on this journey and that's really why um I've been so fortunate to um w- with my youtube channel journey to the goddess to have a space to amplify others work uh, the work of other women doing this kind of work. And I would be remiss not to 
credit that as well to a woman I used to work for, Kalista, at She Is Love, because she really taught me, she embodied that herself Mm. in a way that allowed me to feel safe and and trust other women and also learn how to model that behavior in my own work. Oh, I so appreciate that. And I am certain our listeners do too, because that is something that that competitive energy, which I feel does definitely have, is, is definitely there in part because of the patriarchal perspective that, you know, has been reigning through history. And just love that 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 what you're doing uh, counters that. You know, as we lift each other up, as as we lift one another as women up, it's just a powerful way to model how to do it differently. So I am so Thanks. grateful. Yeah, this is just it's a central part to to the path of the goddess for sure. Yes, you know? mm-hmm. yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I'm so grateful, Annalisa, for your time and your wisdom and for coming to us from Greece here. Um, (laughs) I really, I deeply appreciate the ways in which you effortlessly merge scholarly research, spirituality, and art. So thank you for helping reclaim the divine feminine and restore the sacred reverence. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Oh my, well, I thank you. It was such a pleasure to be here and to have this conversation and to be seen so fully by you. My heart is filled with such joy. And I really mean that. Um, Bless you. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Absolutely. Can you tell us where we can find your work and your, and experience your teachings? (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Yes. Um, You can go to my website, which is journey to the goddess.voyage. You can also go straight to YouTube, uh, type in journey to the goddess TV. And there you can find all of my interviews um, and uh, sign up for my newsletter as well, because then you can stay in touch with everything that I'm doing and upcoming and previous journey to the goddess episodes as well. Wonderful. And, and know that we should all look out for your forthcoming book from inner traditions and hopefully we'll be all updated on your website for that information as well. I can't wait Absolutely. for that to come out. <laughs> thank you. So thank, thank you. you. And to our listeners, thank you for sharing the sacred time with us. May you experience fulfillment on every level and in all directions of time with great ease and joy. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening to the Unapologetic Heroine podcast, featuring remarkable individuals living their truth. For more wisdom on how to support your own journey toward honoring your heart and courageously alchemizing our world through the power of love, pick up my book, The Way of Inanna, A Heroine's Guide to Living Unapologetically, at booksellers worldwide.